This is Katrin with Disability Rights New York. Welcome to our podcast, Empire State of Rights, closed captioned. We are here to bring you information on the most relevant topics regarding disability rights and advocacy. Today we have Michelle Walton, PAD Fellow at DRNY. She's here to discuss the importance of readability. How are you doing today, Michelle? Hi, Katrin. I'm doing great. Thank you for having me back on the podcast. So nice for you to come back and talk to us. This is a really important issue and one that um, I, even I would include myself in that I wasn't really sure what it was to begin with until you talked to us about it um, at our DRNY in Action a couple of weeks ago. So can you start by telling the audience what readability is? Of course. Actually, it's interesting that you say that because I wouldn't have been aware about readability and use of plain language if I hadn't gotten my teaching degree and worked with students with intellectual and developmental disabilities before going to law school. So there are two terms that I'm going to be using um, throughout this interview. So the first one is readability, which is the measure of how easy a piece of text is to read. I'm going to talk about several statistics that are used to assess readability and how you can actually assess readability yourself. Some correspond to a grade level and school, which is great because as having gone through public school, you have a general knowledge about what types of texts that you've read in the past. So the other term is plain language, which is, I'm using a statutory definition here. It is clear, concise, organized, and appropriate for the intended audience. So the main idea here is everyday language should be used to describe complex ideas. And avoiding the use of legal jargon is a big one when it comes to corresponding with our clients. So you said that anyone can utilize or utilize the readability tools when looking at different documents, but can you tell us also who is helped the most by this process? Actually, everyone is helped by um, increasing readability and putting documents into plain language. Makes the text accessible to the widest audience possible. It helps us to better all of us to better understand written information. And especially individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities benefit greatly from documents that are written at least at a fourth grade leading level, which may be a difficult task for us in law and policy because a lot of our civil rights that are derived under the law come with legal jargon themselves. And why is readability so important to achieve? It's important to achieve so people understand what their rights are under the law, especially if you're dealing with the criminal justice system, which is something that I deal with a lot here at DRNY as the criminal justice fellow. And some of the terms for trial procedures can be quite confusing to many individuals. Even those who have a legal education are somehow confused by it, too. Michelle, can you talk to us about the federal and state laws requiring certain documents to be written in plain language? So unfortunately, plain language isn't a universal requirement across the board for every type of writing there is. The federal government enacted the Plain Writing Act of 2010, which requires federal governmental agencies to use plain language in documents that are necessary for receiving any benefit or government service. For example, you're receiving Social Security disability benefits. Those correspondences must be in plain language. And also your tax filing documents. Any information about government services, federal government services, must be in plain language. And any document that explains to individuals how to comply with a federal regulation must be in plain language. Unfortunately, New York only has one law on the books that relates to the use of plain language, and it requires commercial transactions with consumers to be written in plain language, but this unfortunately doesn't extend to all areas of the law. However, even when a document is written in plain language, because the definition is so loose, clear, concise, organized, and appropriate for the intended audience. But that might not mean that it's universally understood by most readers. Can you talk to us about some techniques that people can use to make a document meet a readability level for people with ID and DD? So I take a lot of these um, these techniques and tips from my experience having taught students with intellectual disabilities and also just from the federal government guidance that is already out there and existing. So here are some techniques that can help your writing be accessible to the widest audience possible. 
So first, you should think about your reader and your audience. Who are you writing for? Um, Second, don't be afraid to use pronouns. I mean, during public schooling and undergrad, a lot of professors were, don't use pronouns. But however, using you in a sentence makes it seem like you're talking directly to the reader, which can better facilitate understanding. Use contractions when appropriate, although they're more, I'm going to say, colloquial or informal here. Writing for your audience and making sure that it's accessible in an everyday language can be extremely helpful. Think about the way that you're organizing your piece of writing. Stating the main idea first and then building that foundation with supporting details. Sticking to it and making it as thoughtful as possible will help you guide the reader through what you're trying to say and the information that you need to convey. Stick to your topic. Um, Yet again, this goes along with thoughtful organization. Make sure that you stick to your point. Another thing here is, um, so unfortunately, I'm going to get a little grammar heavy here because it's a little necessary. Use shorter sentences, so avoid modifiers, adverbs, keeping it simple. Another tip is to avoid series in one sentence, so using lists to delineate separate items is really helpful. Using active voice, some of you may remember this as subject, verb, object, and make sure that the subject is doing the acting in the sentence. Be consistent with your wording. Use the same term consistency consistently for a specific thought or object. And another consideration is think about visual formatting. You want your you want your text to be visually accessible to the reader in addition to being linguistically accessible. So use lists, bullet points, spacing between sentences, pictures, and charts to illustrate your ideas. And the next thing is to check the readability score of your text. And how can one measure the readability of their written content? So in Microsoft Word, there's this great feature that you can turn on readability statistics in your options for spelling and grammar checks. So whenever you do a complete spelling and grammar check on a piece of text, a box will pop up and it will provide you with the percentage of passive sentences, so ones that aren't in active voice. And also two statistics also come up, the Fleisch reading ease score and the Fleisch Kincaid grade level score, which I will get to exactly what they mean because math is a little terrifying for me. So the first readability statistic that comes up on Microsoft Word is the Fleisch reading ease score. This statistic was derived from a calculation based on two factors, sentence length and word length. So these seem rather intuitive because sentences containing more words and letters are difficult to understand than shorter sentences. And this statistic is scored on a level on a scale of 0 to 100. 0 being the hardest piece of text to read and 100 being the easiest. So the higher the score, the easier it is for someone to read. Um, Generally, readability on this statistic for an individual with IDDD would probably be around 80, would be a goal. The Fleisch-Kincaid grade level is also takes into account sentence and word length, but this statistic corresponds with someone's grade level in school. So for example... After running a readability analysis on a piece of text, the statistic will appear, for example, 12.6. This would correspond to someone who's in 12th grade and six months within their education during that year. Okay, that is great to know. And we will list these resources for you at the end of the podcast. And can you tell us how readability is being incorporated into the services we're providing here at DRNY? Of course, Katrin. So as PADS Criminal Justice Fellow, I've been working a lot with incarcerated individuals and trying to make reentry information more accessible for them. Because there are existing reentry manuals, however, they're not written at a grade level where most people with IDDD would understand. I checked, for example, the readability levels of passages from New York Public Library's reentry manual. However, some of them were reading at a post-secondary grade level, so 12.6 on the Fleisch-Kincaid grade level scale, which is difficult for any individual, let alone someone with IDDD, to take this essential information in order to successfully re-enter your community and live a happy and healthy crime-free life. 
patients at Rikers Island um, face unique challenges upon reentry back into the community. And this is why we've started this project. So individuals are often released before their expected scheduled release date. And they leave without having a comprehensive meeting with their reentry social worker. So they're left with little information upon release. Medicaid is often not turned on, but if an individual has an unexpected release, because social services and Medicaid are inactive when someone's incarcerated, and individuals can't activate it until 30 days prior to their release date, which leaves people in a lurch because they don't have the necessary supports and services to integrate into the community. Because Medicaid isn't turned on, OPWDD isn't turned on either because that requires an individual to be receiving Medicaid. And also some individuals may not be eligible for OPWDD services but yet have IDDD. So this information would also be great for them as well. There's no re-entry materials specifically tailored to individuals with IDDD. And this is important because individuals with IDDD often leave prison with a lack of support system and safety net assistance, which are two things that are important in decreasing recidivism and re-entry into the community. Another project that PAD has been working on is OPWDD in plain language, and we also have special education in plain language for parents, family members, and advocates to access. Wow, Michelle, that is just a lot of information, and I appreciate you taking the time to come in and talk to us about this. Is there anything else that you want to let our audience know about today? Readability is applicable to all texts, all levels, all sorts of information, not just for legal documents, but for just receiving general information. And also as legal practitioners, many clients in the PAD program may need more accessible texts. So in client correspondence, for example, checking to ensure that the information is in a readable format and at an appropriate grade level would help us better facilitate communications with our clients and lead to better, more positive outcomes in the community. That's great, Michelle. And again, the resources that Michelle talked about will be listed at the end of the podcast. Thank you so much for coming in and talk to us today. Thank you. Empire State of Rights closed captioned has been brought to you by Disability Rights New York, your source for disability rights and advocacy. If you enjoyed our program, and we hope you did, make sure to subscribe, like, and share this post. If there is a subject you would like us to discuss, please email podcast at drny.org or comment below. Tune in next time where we'll bring you more information on disability rights in the state of New York. The closed captioned version of this podcast is available on our YouTube channel. Empire State of Rights closed captioned is now streaming on iTunes and Spotify.